Hello, we're here with Michelle Sarju, who is running for Seattle School Board Director, uh, District 5. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Thank you all for this opportunity to come before you and tell you why I'm running for school board director. Um, I am running because I believe that every child, and I do mean every child, should have access to a high quality public school education. Too often, zip code, race, socioeconomic status, ability status actually impede that opportunity. Um, and so I, I honestly believe and firmly believe that every child deserves a high quality public school um, education. It is our birth, birthright. Um, the totality of my professional experience as a licensed midwife, um, a maternal child health professional, and currently a King County uh, maternal child health professional has, I believe, uniquely prepared me for this. I am a public school mom alum. I went to public school. Um, so I have both experience as a student and experience as a parent of three public school students. Um, as I stated, I was a baby catcher uh, for 12 years. And um, that work, uh, along with broader maternal child health work, we prepare these young people to enter a system that doesn't always support them. And so I believe that I have what it takes to actually make that a reality. Um, my priorities are mental health, teaching a diverse population, supporting seconds. the students as they return, and getting rid of standardized testing. And so these are the high level things that I want to do. Um, they're important. They're all connected to student success. And so as a school board director, I intend to collaborate with other school board members and district officials um, to address these priorities. Great, thank you. So now we'll move into the prepared questions. And again, these responses are two minutes apiece. And if we can go ahead with the first one, Sherry. Hi, um, what policy <coughs> seek to ensure that all students, regardless of gender, race, class, disability, or ethnicity, receive an education to reach their fullest potential? And what would you do to advance anti-racist and indigenous curriculum and promote racial equity in SPS? Okay, so do I have two minutes or one minute? Two minutes. For two minutes, ones. okay. Um, as I stated, um, I, I am a firm believer in public school education. And so this pandemic has really uh, caused harm in some ways for many students. And so I think we need to address the full holistic uh, being before us, what, regardless of what their race or, or gender um, identity is. We need to support their social emotional health as well as mental health. I believe the school district has um, in some ways been able to do that, but not holistically. And it will be more important now than ever um, to ensure that resources such as more family support workers as well as social workers are in place and that teachers are prepared to, um, to receive these students in the condition that they're in. Um, they need to be welcomed with open arms. They need to be supported in this transition. Um, they should not be punished for challenging behavior because they've been gone from a classroom for a year. They've lost a lot of social skills. And so I want to see mental health prioritized. I want to see teachers equipped to teach the diverse population that is in our public schools. Um, I want to see that, um, that teachers are get the support that they need so that they can support students. If teachers are dysregulated, teachers will be dysregulated. In terms of the anti-racist and indigenous curriculum, one of my priorities is mandatory ethnic studies. Um, part of our problem in this country is that there is currently a revisionist history that does not accurately teach our kids about real American history. The last four years has damaged us to such a state that we will need to prioritize ethnic studies um, in our classrooms so that students emerge as adults with an appreciation of everyone, not just one particular race. Great, thank you. 
And question uh, number two, Carrie. All right, this is a long one. What would you do to advocate for ample and equitable funding for K-12 education, including special education, school nurses, counselors, mental health professionals, and para, para educators? Students in special education continue to not receive the education that they are normally, morally and legally entitled to. How would you ensure that students, educators, and schools are supporting both with policy and with funding? Yeah, so I've, I've addressed uh, the mental health um, and I did not include paraeducators. I don't actually like the term paraeducator because para is a marginalized term. Um, so I think the proper term is family support workers. Um, so that's probably the equivalent to a paraeducator. I'm gonna make it equivalent to a paraeducator. Um, and as a new school board member, what I will need to do is equip myself with the current, you know, what is happening currently with the funding. We know our schools are um, underfunded. That has been the way it's been for a very long time. And so I will collaborate with other school board members and district officials to understand what is currently happening in the budget and what is needed. Um, I have lobbied um, my legislators before around certain things. One was not shackling women who are pregnant and giving birth and we were successful at doing that. So I am no stranger to advocacy um, and I will do that for our public school students. Um, it's an abomination that special ed kids needs were not met during this pandemic. Um, there was a wholesale ignoring because um, I feel like people couldn't figure it out. We're adults, that's our job. We need to figure it out. I am not an expert in special education, but I had a child with special needs and I had to advocate in ways, um, I had to use my privilege of education and connection to, to get seconds. what my kid needed. And so, um, I will, I'm a collaborator and that's what I will do. I first need to equip myself with the knowledge and information. And then I need to do the good thinking, the high level thinking with other people to determine what is needed so that all kids can be successful in school and life. Great, thank you. Ooh, this goes fast. Wow. It does go fast. <laughs> I'm out of breath. <laughs> it's like I'm uh, running a marathon here, y'all. <laughs> I know. Um, Alice, question number three. Okay. Um, for several years, directors and leaders have said that uh, SPS's enrollment projections were significantly flawed and coming off of a year of online school, the concerns regarding enrollment projections and budget loom large. What will you do to ensure the district accurately projects enrollment and school budgets for 2021-22 uh, and into the future? Yeah, this is going to be really critical because I, right now, what is happening in our schools is this hybrid um, learning environment where you have some kids coming to school and then you had families who have chosen for very good reasons to keep their kids in a virtual environment. And so one of the things that has to happen before the fall, before I'm elected, is the district has to have a robust plan. Um, and so I actually know the in, incoming uh, school board superintendent, I'm sorry, uh, the public school superintendent, and I do plan to meet with him to talk about what is the plan? How can we develop a, a system where all kids can be successful and thrive, whether they're in the classroom or whether they're virtual? That means teachers need to be equipped to teach in a hybrid environment. I think that this is going to be the way it is um, probably for the next school year. Um, some parents are still not comfortable sending their kids back to school for a variety of reasons, and they will need school board rec directors and dis district administrators to listen to their concerns, to strategize how to solve, solve those and support the families who've made different decisions. Um, enrollment projections have always been flawed. That's not new. Um, and the pandemic has presented a unique opportunity to begin to get at some of those things and those challenges that um, have been put by the wayside that haven't, have not necessarily um, been solved uh, to the fullest extent. So as I've stated, I'm a collaborator, school district board member, 
Our job is nose in, fingers out. We need to let the district administrators do their jobs, but we have to be collaborators. We have to come to the table and collaborate together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excellent, thank you. All right, and now we'll move into the final prepared question, uh, number four, and I will ask that one. Um, do you support SPS continuing option schools such as language immersion, immersion uh, STEM and STEAM, international bachelorette, uh, back, uh, project base and other opportunities at specific schools? Uh, do you support continued transportation for K-8 students to such option schools to offer families equitable public school choices? Yeah, so for the first question, um, the, the two words that stand out are at specific schools. And I know that that is still the case. Um, you know, for example, Washington Middle School has the STEM and STEAM program. And so I do support um, these types of options for parents um, because my kids have been out of the schools for a long time. What I'm not sure as of today, uh, May 4th, uh, 2021 is do kids have equitable access to these programs? And so for me, that's what's really important. Um, we have had a history of kids. Um, we have had a history of programs where only certain kids had access. And I think one of those is uh, the gifted program, the advanced learning. I, it, you know, the name has changed so many times over the last 28 years that I can't keep up. But those programs in theory are all open to all kids, but not in practice. And so if children and their family are interested, for example, in STEM and STEAM, then how can we make that happen? We need to support the, the curiosity um, and the drive of our students. And if they're denied access, then we shut them down. Um, in terms of transportation, absolutely. I think transportation can be an, equity, an equalizing force. Um, some children have parents who can drive them to school every day and pick them up. Other children, their parents depend on our public school transportation system. And so um, it is vital that we figure out how to fund it as well as pay our bus drivers fair and equitable wages. That is something that has to be addressed. Great, thank you. And so now we'll move into the um, to our just questions, follow up questions, and those are responses are one minute apiece. Alice, I see your hand. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, what do you know about, and um, would you sort of support um, uh, further looking into by the district uh, of mastery based learning? Is what I'm interested in. Like, what is your um, familiarity with the concept and, and how would you support mastery based learning um, in uh, the Seattle School District? Well, I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular term. What is that a program currently in the district? No, it's it's more of a concept of, of progression based on mastery of concepts rather than age based cohorts and um, and, you know, sort of like rather than your year 10, you figure you, you went through fifth grade, you should move on. It's more like you figured stuff out in this area. And so you move on, you know, you need more work in this area. So just sort of like more uh, progression based on mastery. Yeah, I what that sounds like to me is supporting the student where they're at, and then uh, providing the type of learning and instruction that they need to thrive and flourish. And if that is what this concept is, then I am in support of that. Um, as a mom of three very different learner types, um, not on the same track, um, that was not their experience. They were expected to sit in their seat and do what they were told in this classroom that was a first grade, second grade, third grade, eighth grade, whatever kind of classroom. Um, I think for many students, that type of system doesn't work. Um, I think if, if, if I'm understanding the concept mastery, um, it, it sounds to me like that is an approach that could benefit all kids, but particularly kids who are particularly strong in one area and not necessarily strong in another. And I will do more research about 
that mastery. <laughs> I don't like the term master, but anyway, I'll work with it. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> it's what we have. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other follow-up questions? I don't know. Go, go ahead, Alex. So, <laughs> um, so um, OSPI recently released reporting, um, uh, school, school districts had um, reported data on discipline rates and the use of restraint. Um, and there's a, there's some, um, the Seattle school district is saying that the, the rates that are being reported on the OSPI website are inaccurate, but regardless, they're, they're still high because the amount should be, you know, no student should be restrained, you know, violently. Um, and it's particularly high among, um, students with special needs. So, um, what are your thoughts on how to address that issue? Um, well, that would be something um, I am very interested in, and my assumption about the the rates are disproportionately high and not accurate is because it doesn't make the Seattle Public School District look good. Um, it is not surprising. It was happening when my kids were in school. Um, sure, it affects kids um, in special education, but it also disproportionately affects black and brown kids. Um, I said, let's see, I think, I don't know if I commented on this, but in terms of um, bringing our kids back and supporting them, they don't need punishment, right? They need, the, they need the adults in the room to be able to work with them to help them regulate. Um, I am not a fan of police officers in schools, seconds. and I am not a fan of um, physical restraint to the detriment of students. There might be a case where a type of unharmful physical restraint might be necessary, but in most cases, I don't believe it's necessary. Great, thank you. Any further questions? I have one. Um, actually, it's not really a question. It's more of a, allowing you to take a minute to talk a little bit about your stand, the stand, you, how your your stance on standardized testing. Oh, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, uh, no kid is standard. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have I had three very different children uh, with three very different academic needs. Um, only one of my children was good at this quote unquote standardized testing system. Um, and I don't believe it actually proves anything other than um, for the most part that you had your your families had the resources to get you additional help to learn how to be a good test taker. I was a horrible standardized test taker. Um, it did not prove anything. I've been very successful and never did well on any of those standardized tests. What I wanna see is evidence-based evidence metrics of assessment um, that actually speak to the student's ability and their achievement and that cannot be discovered through a multiple choice or a checkbox. So I wanna see standardized testing go away. We have that opportunity now as a result of the pandemic, we need to seize this opportunity. Great, thank you. Any further questions? Um, I have another one. <laughs> So, well, I'm a little worried about what your colleagues are doing there. They're not asking me any questions. <laughs> I don't have kids. I don't know what's going on in the school. <laughs> so the question um, that I was going to ask mostly has to do with the position itself. You know, as you probably know, it doesn't pay anything and has a little support. Um, how do you propose or how do you intend to help like truly serve the public? in this odd position where, where you know you have a lot of responsibility but not a ton of support. Yeah, I call this a, a very large thankless volunteer opportunity. Um, and clearly uh, I'm not interested in it for the money because there isn't any. Um, and I'm also not a politician. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a mom, I'm a former public school parent. Um, I'm tired of seeing specifically black and brown children be continuously marginalized. Um, and my intent, you know, when I get across this finish line is to equip myself with knowledge of what are the issues, what has been tried, what has worked. I'm not interested in changing things that are actually working. Um, what I'm interested in doing is collaborating 
Hopefully the other school board members are also collaborators, but we seconds. can no longer afford to fail our children. And so um, I intend to meet with community. Um, I will hold community events to hear from parents. Um, that's how you figure out what parents need for their children is by convening them and listening to them. And that's something I do in my personal and professional work. Great, thank you. And we are almost done. If you would like, you may take Carrie. a minute to wrap up um, if you'd like. Okay, well, I'm assuming this is the part where I say something like, um, I really hope you guys plan to endorse me. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, to summarize, um, I am running for the children. I'm not running um, because I have some future political aspirations. Um, I am running because the pandemic has exposed things that have been under the surface and they've been brought to light and we can no longer afford to ignore them. Our children need to be prepared for uh, to be successful adults and to be happy, healthy, safe and thriving as adults. And it is time for us adults to step up to the plate to address the challenges, to collaborate, to figure out workable, long lasting solutions. seconds. I believe that my professional experience as well as my personal experience as a public school mom has uniquely prepared me to do this job. And I look forward to the endorsement of the King County Democrats. Thank you so much.